Hello, Dr. Parker. Karubu sana. So that means that you are very welcome from Kenya, which is where I am presently. Thank you for agreeing to have a chat with me this evening. Thank you for inviting me to have a chat with you this evening. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Parker, you have developed a great body of work around supporting healing from an ethnic and racial and stress and trauma perspective using yoga therapy. Your work is highly regarded globally and we're both certified yoga therapists. How do you describe what yoga therapy is exactly? So from my perspective and in the work that I do, I utilize yoga as a therapeutic healing modality to support emotional well-being and, and emotional balance. Um, and I think that I, I really do believe that all yoga has the potential to be to has therapeutic value. Mm -hmm. uh, yoga therapists are typically trained to teach yoga or to share yoga. I like to say it better that way, to share the yoga practice from a therapeutic perspective, from a therapeutic perspective of wellness and well-being, as opposed to the perspective from the perspective of pathology and mm -hmm. the, the disease model. So I'll, mm -hmm. that's as much as I'll say about that. So. Thank you. And that can that's be done great. actually, and it can be done physically. Well, so so the biopsychosocial. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add spiritual model. Yeah, is really what we um, pay attention to, and supporting balance within all spheres of being through various yoga techniques and the philosophy. Thank and you. And breath practices. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll ask the next question. Um, so coming through to the other side of the collective trauma of, co of COVID, what can we learn from studies that have been done on the impact that COVID has had on so-called Black, Indigenous and non-Black people of colour in the USA? Could you please speak to that? When you, I, there, there are many lessons to be learned, I think, but... Mm. When you are in what I call an inhospitable environment, an environment that, that does not support or prioritize your own health and well being because of environmental factors, because in the United States, of, um, and I would assume this may be true other places too, the racial segregation that we experience to, um, implicit bias of healthcare providers to little access to healthcare, you know, it goes on and on and on. It has a negative impact on health and well-being. It is not because of someone's race or ethnicity. It's because of the circumstances that's, that end up creating inflammatory responses in the body and in the psyche that become chronic, that become disease. Mm. So people were vulnerable. When, when, you, when, you're, when your uh, immune system is compromised because you're under so much stress all of the time, mm. there's just not the ability to for the body to do what it naturally does, which is heal itself. And so then you have to seek outside attention. You have to seek medical care. If it's not available, then you, you know, you, you just don't have that option. So there's so many, um, you know, the word that we're using here in the United States, systemic reasons mm -hmm. that COVID had such a negative impact on people who couldn't access uh, available health care. But it's not just the healthcare. It's the it's the circus. It's the environmental circumstances. It's the mm -hmm. social circumstances. Um, it's the educational circumstances. Mm -hmm. Everything mounting up on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. you. And so what human beings do, by the way, is we adapt to those situations. Mm -hmm. out, of, because, out of necessity. But ad adapting to a toxic environment is not good for one's health and well-being. But that's what ha that's what happens, and I and I'm sure that I know that that's why um, <clears throat> people who are living at the margins are more vulnerable to yeah. illness and disease. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about language and ask you uh, about language because it's you know, nuances in, in language matter. Can you please clarify um, which ethnic groups specifically you refer to uh, in our discussions that are coming ahead today? So I wasn't referring to any specific ethnic group. Um, yeah. I, but I do know, I mean, ethnicity is really, uh, contains within it our, our culture, our language, our customs, our beliefs. And so when you are living in a culture, a dominant culture, <clears throat> excuse me, that doesn't share your, your culture, mm -hmm. um, then there's, you, there's a tendency for dominant cultures to make you the other. See? Yeah. And, or you, as the other try really, 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 really hard to fit in. That's very stressful. Mm. Assimilation is very stressful and can be traumatic. I've, I've got stories that, you know, mm. and there's research that demonstrates that. And so when I talk about ethnicity, I say, you know, take a look at your culture, your beliefs, your uh, language, um, your customs, and it applies to you, if whoever you are, it doesn't matter whether you're in dominant culture or not. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. When I talk about race, when we talk about race, which is um, a social construct, somebody made it up. Mm -hmm. um, that's based on physical characteristics. Yeah. And in the United States, skin color has become the identity of Americans. And the closer you are to white, the higher up you are in the hierarchy. Mm. If you're if you the the you know if you're brown, you're in the middle. And if you're black or indigenous, you're at the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. And so um and, and these as I said these these are constructed identities, but that's the world we live in. We live in a racialized yeah. world. And so mm. we have to adapt to the reality of the situations we find ourselves in. And then we have to, when we are, when we are in jeopardy because of these categories that we find ourselves in, we have to find ways to resist. We have to find ways to um, push back on the injustices that come from something that you have absolutely no control over. That's also, well, it's, you know what, it's stressful, but it's also healing. Mm -hmm. When you can find a way to stand up to injustice, there's something very healing about that as well. The research shows that too. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It's a, a lot of information there. I'm just letting that sink in a little bit here. Mm -hmm. um, an example, this is, this is interesting, I think. I was having a conversation with a Zimbabwean yes. and we were talking about <clears throat> racial stress and trauma as, as a part of a yoga teacher training mm. that um, I was being invited to participate in. And it was very interesting what he said. We were in, uh, it was a group of South Africans and he was part of the um, conversation. And so there were, there were, you know, South Africa has different divisions of race and ethnicity. So mm -hmm. there was a black South African there. There was a colored South African there. He was, he was the black, the, the Zimbabwean was black. There was yeah. a colored person there. And then there was a white mm -hmm. person. 
All right, so we're all having this conversation and he says, I don't think I would be able to teach yoga based on um, race, you, you, you know, teach about stress and trauma as it pertains to race. He said, I've never experienced racial discrimination. So I'm American. So yeah. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I'm also a psychologist. So I know how to take a deep breath and listen. Because <laughs> mm. what I wanted to do was say, oh, come on, you know, seriously. But I said, really, tell me more. Because I, yeah. I was surprised. I'm thinking he's in denial. Mm, okay. He explained in great detail why he thought he was not well suited to do this work and that he would refer someone to somebody who knows how to do the work because mm -hmm. it's not him because he's not had the lived experience. Now, I don't know, at least in America, this would come as a shock to most Americans because in America, as I said, our <clears throat> racial hierarchy is based on skin color. This was a dark skinned man. Yes. And it would be hard to believe for an American, regardless of race or ethnicity, that he had never experienced racial discrimination. Yeah. But when you grow up, this is this is also a difference between Africans and African Americans. Mm -hmm. Many Africans <clears throat> know their indigenous roots. That was never robbed from them. We don't. What was taken from African Americans is our identities, our languages, our culture, mm -hmm. our food, our dance, everything. And so we have had to craft a unique culture called African American. Yes. And that and, and so that's different than a black African or a white African in mm -hmm growing up in various regions of the of the uh, continent, so. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, this is very, you mentioned it. You said that language is very nuanced, and it is. Yeah. And it's important for us to begin to appreciate and understand the nuances of language and the different experiences that people are having. I often ask myself, when I'm doing this work, um, mm. I often ask myself, if you've not had the lived experience, are you really in a position to be able to offer help or to mm -hmm. even understand? And so I always come around to the that I ask that question frequently, and and I always come back to yes, I believe you can, but you have to be emotionally prepared as the therapist to receive whatever somebody's bringing to you. So, for example in this conversation. If I had gotten into an argument with the man to explain to him how it's impossible for him not to have experienced racial discrimination yeah. as a black man in the world, this would not have been helpful. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I, didn't, I, because I hadn't had that experience. But as I mm. thought about it, you know what, when you grow up and you're in the majority and everybody around you, the majority of people around you are like you, Mm. It's not an issue. Yes. It's not an issue. That's not the world I live in. But I can come to understand that world if I'm open minded, if I'm not defensive, if I'm not um, attached to my experience and my beliefs. Mm. Mm. Um, as you were sharing that story, my mind was going to, as because I'm Australian, my mind is going to uh, the experiences and stories that I have grown up with in Australia and, and for Indigenous Australians and how language and culture has been taken away from Indigenous Australians. And so there's, um, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, and my mind also goes to um, what can be done for people who are experiencing um, or who have a significant trauma background that as therapists we can um, help a lot of people for all sorts of different um, types of traumas that people have been experiencing. You don't have to have experienced the same trauma 
as the client to be able to help them, to help themselves, yeah. No, but you have to be able to receive what the person yes. is sharing with you, which may be yes. outside of your comprehension, one's comprehension. Oh, you know, one's absolutely. To appreciate that, oh, this person is having a very different experience than I mm. am familiar with. And so that's why as therapists, our presence is everything. See, what a wounded person needs most is the presence of someone who can sit there. And, well, and again, this is cultural also, who can sit there and listen and receive what they're sharing. Mm. Instead mm. of trying to fix it, make it better, f feeling bad about it. you know, And all of those feelings in the therapist may come up. So I say that that's why we have to do these practices so that we can learn to sit in the discomfort of our own feelings mm. long enough to hear what somebody else is telling us. Long enough, it's, it's sitting in the discomfort of self-reflective awareness. That's what therapists have to do. And that's what we're trying mm. to teach our clients as well. Mm -hmm. But we too. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm looking at my long list of questions here that I wanted to ask you. Um, uh, okay, so uh, talking back about COVID, cycling back to this, uh, do you know if members of the global majority who are non-white were affected at the same rates during COVID as those in the USA? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I do know that, that um, the disparities in the United States were prof are profound. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> talking about trauma um, and bringing together, closer together the worlds of yoga therapy and clinical sexology and relationship therapy. Um, my mind is also going to what is happening in the UK. Um, and I, I wanted to share some statistics or, yeah, some research that has been done. And this was, um, I came across this information recently from it was a webinar that was held by COSRICH. So COSRICH is the governing body for sex and relationship therapists in the UK. So the webinar that I attended was on psychosexual and relationship issues and trauma following the perinatal experience. So I'd just like to share, share three bits of information with you, if I may. So I'll read it verbatim. Uh, black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Mixed ethnically, sorry, mixed ethnicity women have three times the risk. Asian women have twice the risk. Second point, suicide is the leading direct cause of maternal death within a year of pregnancy and mm. UK studies show that women from a black, Asian and minority ethnic background are significantly more likely than white British women to be suffering from mental health disorders in this period, yet we're less likely to access treatment. Pakistani and Indian women are at greatest risk. And the third point, physical impact of racism. Um, so studies show that the health of black women begins to deteriorate in early adulthood as a consequence of socioeconomic disadvantage. So talking about the biopsychosocial <laughs> again, um, yeah. Um, there are many different needs that uh, people in the UK um, Black people and ethnic minorities um, are needing support with regards to their health mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. And this is just with regards to, um, you know, the perinatal experience, but it, it is a, a very big concern 
and I can see that uh, yoga therapy helping people to attend to um, their traumatic histories would have a significant impact on helping people um, in in the UK, uh, helping with these statistics, but I'm also thinking about people globally. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if this is maybe a good opportunity to ask you about John Her John Henry had John Henryism. John Henryism. Yeah. Yes, I will. Yeah, I'll talk about John Henryism, but I also want to yeah. just kind of this is something that I that that I'm paying a lot of attention to now. So, given yes. the statistics that you just shared, yes, what it, what we want to ask ourselves is. Mm. Is the ethnicity and or race of the healthcare providers? Mm -hmm. And what are they doing or not doing yeah. that contributes to these appalling statistics? You mm -hmm. see what I mean? Yeah. Even categorizing, I didn't know that, that uh, within a year of giving birth, uh, women are at more at risk of suicide. I did not know that. Yeah. But if you just think about, you know, and this is not my area of expertise, but if you just think about the physical changes, the hormonal changes mm. women go through to throughout a pregnancy and then, you know, uh, giving birth, and then whatever other circumstances, their external circumstances are impacting them. From my perspective, these are, this is not what I would call a mental health issue. When your hormones are all over the place, that is not a mental health issue. <laughs> mm. That is something else. That's psychobiological. It's, you know, now it impacts our emotions. It impacts the way we think. But I think to even categorize some of this stuff as mental health issues is, um, I'm not a fan, I'll put it that way. Mm. I think that to recognize that the circumstances of these individual women need to be taken into consideration, this is where yoga therapy yeah. is helpful, that we also, the healthcare providers, regardless of race or ethnicity, ethnicity would be um, patients would be at less risk if the healthcare providers understood the root of the root cause mm. of why are these women committing suicide? You know, why are these, why is there so much death? What, 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 what's going on here? And it's not with them. So it's, it's, it's the, so the answer becomes there is something wrong, but it's not with you. Mm. And the healthcare providers, need to start asking, how am I contributing? How might I be contributing to these appalling statistics? And what can I begin to do differently? Mm. Can I sit in my own self-reflective awareness and the discomfort of that to ask that question and begin to get some answers? John Henryism. Yes. Sherman James is an epidemiologist in the United States who wanted to understand in the 1970s, why are these health, what's with these health disparities that we're talking about? Why is it black men, he did his research on men, are much more vulnerable to heart disease, metabolic disease, um, high blood pressure, uh, early, <clears throat> early death, then white American men. And he traced it all the way back to the end of the um, of enslavement, the enslavement of African Americans, mm -hmm. where people when they gained their freedom, and thought they had access, full access to the rights and privileges of being American, mm -hmm. discovered, no, <laughs> this was, you know, no, wait a minute, something's wrong here. So they just kept they learned, they began to they believed that if they just worked hard enough, 
if they just kept working harder and harder and harder, they could overcome these barriers that they had nothing to do with. These were external barriers. It had nothing to do with them working harder. They had already worked, they, they were enslaved. <laughs> and they worked very hard when enslaved. Mm. But that is a belief that has been passed on from one generation to the next. And so mm. in America, is, this may be true globally, but I, I can speak with authority about America. Anyway, so what he discovered is that, you, you know, that, that this, this determination to always work as hard as you can, no matter what, and to work harder than everybody else is working, is it's really become part of our DNA almost. Yeah. So we show up 200% better because we learn, we're taught, in order to get half as far, you have to be twice as good. This is, this is what we're taught. This is what we're raised <laughs> on. And so we, so we keep doing that. Michelle Obama, the former first lady of the United yes. States, wrote in her book, Becoming, she, this is what she said. She said, I learned to march to the beat of unending effort with a willingness to tolerate misery to achieve a goal. When you're doing that every single day of your life, <laughs> all of your life, there's going to be, you're, there, there will be consequences to that behavior, whether it's physical or emotional or mental. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's critically important for us to understand the root causes of some of this behavior. The root causes of this behavior, overachieving, working hard, no matter what, never resting, um, pushing, 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 pushing. Now, it has its benefits. You, you know, there, there, there are, I mean, you can achieve a lot when you're living like that until you can't. So, mm. yeah. That is an adaptive response. That is not a pathological response. It's an adaptive response to a culture that doesn't allow equal access to the same rights and privileges that the dominant culture shares. You see what I'm saying? Okay. It's important to know that and to understand that. Now, as providers, I, what do we do about that? Mm -hmm. well, it's a good question. But yeah. I think we know ourselves and know what our own relationship is to, you know, in other words, you know, for <laughs> we have to ask ourselves hard questions. You know, what? How might I be contributing to this? And what can mm -hmm. I do differently? Mm -hmm. Well, on the what can I do differently? So uh, when I attended your webinar at the end of last year and you were talking about post-traumatic growth mm -hmm. in relation to in, in yoga therapy, and I just I really wanted to share this information with my colleagues um, and my clients because I, I really want people to hear what you have to say uh, about what can be done uh, from a yoga, yoga therapy perspective because I think that the amount of reach that it can have to help a lot of people is absolutely immense and it's incredibly accessible. Um, so my next question <laughs> for you is that could you please um, explain what post-traumatic growth is and what does it look like through the lens of yoga therapy? Post-traumatic growth <clears throat> is the next step after post-traumatic stress. Yes. So you're going to be stuck in it. Mm. We, most of us have been traumatized. I, in fact, we live in a world of unhealed, unacknowledged stress and trauma, period. Yes. Okay, so this applies to everybody. So could you say that again, If you just please? think about, yeah, if you just think about <laughs> the wars that we've all fought, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely, and there's, yeah. And, 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 and there's no help for anybody coming home from the war to get over whatever traumas they've experienced. That's just yeah. an example. That's one example. Yeah. Yes. So... When you, so you have to pay attention 
to how you have been impacted by these events in your life, but you don't have to remain stuck in them. But you do have to feel them. You do have to feel them. One adaptation to trauma and stress is to numb out Mm. and to tune out and to deny that I'm in pain. So I drink or I do drugs or I do all of the all the all of the ways we distract ourselves so that we don't have to feel what we're feeling. We try to cheer up. We you know whatever it is we're doing. You have to be willing to stop long enough. As I said before to sit in that self-reflective awareness yeah. which can be painful. And re and experience what you're trying not to feel. <laughs> by doing all the stuff we do and the yoga therapy can help us do that how this is why i like restorative yoga and yoga nidra is also helpful but i i I just i like restorative yoga a lot because yoga restorative yoga teaches us to be still for those people who don't know what restorative yoga do we can we assume that everyone knows or shall i Describe. Please, All right. Please so, go yoga ahead. is a particular form of yoga that utilizes, we don't use any muscle strength or stretching because that creates stress. And the whole purpose of the restorative yoga practice is to reduce, to minimize stress. So, what we use instead are blankets and bolsters and blocks and all kinds of cushy props to support the body in holding postures for extended periods of time, Mm -hmm. all while using our breath to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system that slows us down and helps us rest, all right? So when you're in stress and trauma chronically and you don't even know it, which is what chronic means, you're not even aware of it because you've adapted to it, Mm -hmm. you're on high alert most of the time, whether you know it or not. So even when you go to sleep, you're not really resting because your nervous system doesn't turn itself off. Mm. When you can do this with awareness, which is what the practice teaches, that if you can manage to stay awake (laughs) while you're coming into this deep state of relaxation, you begin to notice where do I hold my stress? What does stress feel like? What does relaxation feel like? And how does it feel to be safe in stillness? Because when you're on high alert, you don't feel safe in stillness. So therefore, you don't Mm -hmm. bother to. That's not one of your practices, typically. Mm -hmm. So yoga therapy from a yoga. So when that happens, when we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, we can evoke the relaxation response, which is a real physiologic response. And when that happens, blood pressure drops, metabolism slows down, heart rate slows, brain waves slow, and breathing becomes more efficient. So think about this. So when so when you are caught up in a cycle of of high effort coping, mm-hmm. our yoga teaches us that we need to balance effort and ease yes and people who are under tremendous stress and um and who are in trauma don't tend to experience the ease even if they're in a state of numbness that's not a state of ease Mm -hmm. and so these practices support us in becoming aware of the state we're in and aware of ways to ease those states. When you get on the other side of that, then you can begin to reflect on the value to the extent that there is value in the traumatic experience I have had. That's not easy. This is not easy. And it isn't a quick fix. Yes. But it is very supportive of health and well-being. Very supportive. And so these practices help us really make important changes. We can change what what are what's the story I'm telling myself, for example, you know, 
you may not re- that, that causes me to be tight because of a trauma I experienced 20 years ago that I shoved down and tried really hard not to feel. And whenever it comes mm-hmm. up, I do something to distract myself from it. If I can just sit with it long enough to gain some insight and to understand what's going on, now I can begin to change the narrative also, because that was 20 years ago. This is now. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's very, but again, the therapist has to be doing the practices himself or themselves <laughs> um, in order to guide someone else in that practice. You have to know what the practice can do by practicing mm-hmm. yourself. And then you mm-hmm. show, see, then we can show up centered in a state of peace in a state of calm, does this last forever? No, that's why we have to keep doing it over and over and over again, because all this mm-hmm. stuff is always still going on around us. And our tri- and our, our, our wounds, I think the first chapter of my book is, um, I think the wounds heal, but the scars still hurt. So it doesn't make anything go away. It just helps us heal. But mm-hmm. scars are still very tender and can be, you know, um, you, 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 they can be reopened. You can be rewounded, and so we learn to protect ourselves also, because we learn what it, you you learn in these practices what it feels like to feel good. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, like um, I, you know, when you get a massage, for example, you know, you're mm-hmm. enjoying the massage and you think you're really relaxed, and then boom, you you drop down into another level of relaxation, and you and you say, oh, I didn't even know I was holding any tension there. That. Mm. it's that mm. Mm. yes um it's a <clears throat> it's a beautiful practice to help so many people um even if you don't know what your trauma has been you don't as have to. well yeah no. because i'll say this this is important we're not dealing with the trauma we're not dealing mm. with the issue. we're dealing with the nervous system yes and when you have a when your nervous system is contracted around a wound it's normal and natural to, you know, when you get hurt physically mm. or even when your heart breaks, we go like this. We contract. Mm. Nothing. That's normal and natural. It's when we remain in a contracted state. Yes. That it becomes problematic for us and creates more you know, and, and begins to create health problems and relationship problems and. Yeah. Work Absolutely. Problems. So yeah. this and, is a practice that keeps us from remaining. Sorry, I was just going to uh, where my mind went just then listening to you say that was being in that contracted state. So in psychosexual relationship therapy, I'm thinking about all of the many different problems um, that people have from having so much tension because their pelvic floor is in a contracted state. Um, and it, yeah, it's 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 a lot. So um, there are many different <laughs> ways that yoga therapy, uh, through the tools of restorative yoga, and, and I feel like yoga nidra can can help uh, help a lot of people. And you can yeah. do it yourself. You don't absolutely class. You don't have to have. A t- although it's it's nicer mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Yeah. But these are practices that anybody can do. Anybody can yes. do physically. Now, mm. psycho-emotionally is differently. You know, if you if you can't tolerate being still for any length of time, then as the ther that that's something you want to know. If you feel like you're going to jump out of your skin, which I'm sure we've all had that experience. I know I have. Mm. Mm. How if can I teach? Can I just stay here for one more breath? That's the work. That's the practice. That's the therapy. Let me just stay here for one more breath and then Mm -hmm. I'll jump out of my skin. (laughs) Yeah. I I think also with a regular practice, because you're um, strengthening those neural pathways from the brain to the body to, so the brain begins to understand, ah, this is what it feels like to feel safer, to feel more relaxed in my body. And over time, uh, you can find it a little more easier to jump into that more relaxed state 
because you're more practiced at it, but it does take time for it to do. Um, yeah. And it does, so, even Dean Ornish, who is a, I'm not interrupting you, but I hope it's okay. Please go ahead. Dean Ornish, who is a, a physician and mm -hmm. uh, uh, prescribes basically yoga and other uh, various lifestyle practices to support cardiac health. And mm -hmm. it, it's, he's researched that in fact, he can, e you can even reverse cardiac disease by doing some of the practices that he recommends of which yoga is one. He says that the brain is much more attracted to what's pleasant than what isn't. And so as you begin to experience what's pleasant, you want more of that. Yeah. More of that. And that's what I think yoga as a therapeutic intervention has to offer. I want more of that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm looking, <laughs> this is how I roll. I'm looking at all of my questions that are in front of me, but we've actually answered many of them in the, the last um, bit of discussion that we've had. Um, just give me a moment, please. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, can you please speak to the importance of stimulating the vagus nerve? activating the parasympathetic nervous system response in post-traumatic growth okay well i when when i talked about tapping yeah. the relaxation response mm. what you're doing is is inviting the parasympathetic system which is part of the vagus system to come online mm. when you're sympathetic your fight flight or your the, the part of you that moves, because sometimes we need to be able to move. We need to be yeah. able to get out of harm's way, for example. Mm. That is necessary. You don't want to be still because you're not safe in, <laughs> in every yeah. situation. So you need to know when to move, but you also, that needs to be balanced by when to be still, when to mm. rest. Um, when both are online, we're in balance. We're in balance. And that's how the vagus nerve becomes toned when we do these practices. If you're never inviting the parasympathetic to come online, mm. you're you're and 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 mostly you're just in the fight flight mode or the movement mode. If that's mm. if, if you're stuck there, then you can't move back and forth as necessary. That's called flexibility. It's a nervous system response. We want a, we want a flexible, toned nervous system, so mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Stephen Porges talks about the the vagal system putting on the the vagal break. In other words, when your parasympathetic, when your rest and digest system is working well and healthy, when you're not dysregulated, you can call on that to keep your reactivity from creating a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So when you have experienced a high level of stress mm -hmm. or trauma for such a long period of time, and even if it's uh, generational, where you're continually on the go, where you have to be making up, doing so much more than what, like keeping on top of things. Uh, yeah, the importance of slowing down. The importance of even just pausing mm -hmm. and resting is just so, so important mm -hmm. for the body to be able to heal itself to then become healthy. I mean, uh, as you're speaking, it's fascinating, uh, this doctor who's uh, saying that you can reverse um, cardiac challenges. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, uh, I wonder if work was Sorry, published I think, in the 70s the late 70s mm. okay um i wonder if it's a good time to share my screen with you okay um so uh i've created a picture of superimposed of the vagus nerve um and side by side with uh Ida and pingala so mm. i wonder if you could please speak to some uh, crossover between the two just bear with me as a moment for a moment as I share my screen. 
Okay, should be able to see my screen here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we have the vagus nerve mm -hmm. starting in the back of the brain, wrapping all the way around the jaw in the nose, going down the throat, wrapping all the way around through the different organs in the body and deep inside the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So the vagus nerve sending information from the brain into the body and beautifully from the body back into the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so can you please speak to the vagus nerve a little more and Ida and Pingala? Thank you. I will. <clears throat> I will try. Thank so you. Um, the vagus nerve, the, the construct that you have mm -hmm. here is based on, a, a, you know, the physiological expression of movement, energy. Mm -hmm. The <clears throat> Ida and Pingala, the diagram, the chakra system is energetic. It's not physiologic. We know that we don't yes. have <laughs> mm -hmm. these things inside, yes. inside of us moving around. All right, yeah. 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 But what we do know, it's the same as I said about when the vagus nerve, when, when our nervous system is in balance, Mm. We have both available to us, the ability to move, the ability to be still, and to know the difference, to know when it's wise to move and when it's better to be still. Right? Yes. That becomes available to us when we have this physiologic balance. The Ida and Pingala, when, when the Ida and Pingala are in balance, they can move through the Shashumna, Yes. which is the main channel that we're yes. seeing here. I don't know if you can see my little arrow here, but I can. So <laughs> probably mm -hmm. not. But I, it's following um, the spine, essentially. Yeah, it's following the spine. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so energetically, we now are in balance. We're now in balance. And when, you are, when you're energetically in balance, again, it's, it's easier to to become you're clearer you're just clearer you have the ability to discern what's wise what isn't what supports well-being what doesn't mm. it's not magic mm. it is magic it's it's a balanced system supports health and well-being it supports mm. in uh, physiologic terms in medical terms it supports homeostasis yeah that state in which healing can occur. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. when there's injury, when there's harm, whether it's physical or emotional, when there's injury or harm, when we're in balance, regardless of, regardless of the, the, um, the language that we use or even the constructs that we use, we're in balance, we are now in health. We're now. And that doesn't mean that if you have a disease, for example, that the disease goes away. It means that you are in health. Mm. Mm. Yes. And there's a difference. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn off my sharing of the screen now. I can see you a little bit better. Hello again. Hi. <laughs> um, I like by the way, that was, I like the. Thank the, you. Yeah, nice. Because I, I think it's really important to actually see how big the vagus nerve actually is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the longest yeah. in the body. Yeah, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'd like to now ask you uh, a little more about. Um, some yogic practices which sit within the wider length of Tantra that can be used to stimulate the, the vagus nerve um, to self-regulate and methods to perhaps co-regulate. Mm -hmm. So I always say, no matter what, no matter where, yoga is a breath practice. Mm -hmm. And so we use our breath to self-regulate. We use our, if you didn't do anything else, but mm -hmm. sit in stillness, and but focus your awareness right now. Let's do it together. So just sure. either lower your gaze or close your eyes. And I would invite everyone listening who wants to, to do this. And begin to turn your focus inward. 
and make your breath your focal point. If it's helpful to put one hand over your heart, one hand over your belly so that you can feel the movement of breath that way, do so. So you notice the expansion of the body when you inhale and the very slight hollow hollowing out of the body when you exhale. Or you might notice the coolness of breath on your inhale and the warmth of your breath when you exhale. Some might even be able to feel the breath on your upper lip as you inhale and exhale. Just follow your own natural, normal, rhythmic breath. And then when you're ready, you can return your eyes to the screen. Thank you. And what difference did that make to you, Lisa? Well, for me, it was it was it was calming, and I could feel the difference mm -hmm. because doing the interview with you, my heart is going boop 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 because I am a little nervous. So I was very conscious of the strength, the feeling of my heart beating quite strongly, but I also experienced the the soothing reminder that the breath is always there, that I can come back to the breath, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was it had a, a calming effect, and I thank you <laughs> for giving over. me that moment. That's, yeah, yoga, and that's yoga therapy, and yeah. it is always available to us, no matter mm -hmm. who we are, any point, any time, anywhere, just to tune into your breath and be intentional about paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then there are other things you can do with your body, but really it's, it's, it's a breath practice. It is. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so that's something that people can do uh, to self-regulate is just to notice the breath and to to slow down. Um, and uh, of course, the breath is also important when we're co-regulating. Yes. Um, can you speak a little to some practices that can be um, used to co-regulate? Well, uh, you know, it was interesting that in in when we when you sent me the set of questions that you wanted to yeah. mm -hmm. uh, ask, you mentioned uh, what about in couples therapy, for example? Yeah. And I and I I hadn't thought of it, um, but and it doesn't have to be an intimate couple, but yeah. if you're working with someone, and yeah, you know what? As the therapist, you can do it yourself. If you mm -hmm. sit around back to back mm -hmm. and just breathe together one hand on your heart one hand on your belly guess what happens yes now you co-regulate calmness mm -hmm. is contagious so is agitation yeah. Yeah. so a calm nervous system can impact an agitated nervous system which is why mm -hmm. the therapist needs to make sure that we are calm coming into our encounter with our patients. We need to enter into that relationship or that, that moment with a sense of friendliness, with a sense of curiosity, a sense of warmth, and that in and of itself is powerful. But if and and sometimes you don't have to do the, you know sitting back to back breathing, but that that would be a lovely way really to have each of you experience it and and to have the embodied experience of what does it feel like mm -hmm. to do that to breathe together absolutely yeah to breathe together you can yeah. face each other 
Mm. One of the things I like to do, if we, if you and I were in person, I would say, okay, we're, we'll do a call and response. Sure. Okay. All right. Lisa, I am breathing in just like you. Dr. Parker, I am breathing in just like you. Lisa, I am breathing out just like you. Dr. Parker, I am breathing out just like you. We are breathing in and out together. We are breathing out in and out together. Mm-hmm. How does that feel to you? Connected. Is that nice? I feel that you're, yeah, I feel that you're really seeing me. Yeah, and where are you? Um, yeah, I'm Physical in Kenya. Right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm in Palm Springs, California. And mm. um, there is a screen separating us. Yes. But that's how we establish connection. Isn't that nice? Beautiful, yeah. It's uh, So there are wonderful techniques for the therapist to be working with the client or clients, but also clients to be working with each other in, in partner yeah. therapy. Exactly. So I, I'm, I'm thinking of some uh, techniques like uh, uh, hugging to relax, like mm-hmm. to have that proprioception and mm-hmm. to feel the, the importance of the, the touch, the warmth, mm-hmm. the breath, the scent, feel the heartbeat, mm-hmm. and just to feel that calming of yourself and your partner. That's right. Beautiful. Mm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Everything can be yoga. <laughs> yeah, well, when you're living it, when you're living mm-hmm. it, everything is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. It's not. It's not an exercise class where. Where, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Trust me, I have taken mm-hmm. lots of very active, acrobatic, athletic yoga and loved every minute of it. That's mm-hmm. not what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> so I like to say to my clients, you can practice yoga when you're driving the car, when you're washing the mm-hmm. dishes. Everything can be yoga if you are mindful of the breath, mm-hmm. awareness of the movement. And when you are completely engaged in the senses in what you're doing, when you're no longer thinking about what pulls you into the past or pulls you into the future, being here and now. And, you know, the first uh, sutra yes. in Patanjali Sutras is yeah. and the yoga begins. It begins when you get off your mat. Yeah. That's when the, the yoga. Yoga. Yeah. Yoga Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dr. Parker, thank you so very much for sharing your wisdom and experience and strategies, uh, tools that therapists can be using with clients and also that uh, any clients who uh, are listening to this can start to think about perhaps, yeah, giving yoga nidra or restorative yoga an absolute try um, Mm -hmm. to bring their bodies back into a state of balance or conscious breathing yes absolutely yeah thank you you're welcome thank you thank you very much